Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Roseanne Rodriguez. I am the Coalition's Director for Concerned Veterans for America here in Virginia. If this is your first time tuning in, Concerned Veterans for America is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We are veteran and military family driven. Uh, we focus on issues that threaten our freedom and prosperities, and today we will be focusing on the U.S. debt and the impact it has on our national security. Um, as many of you know, we are well over $28 trillion in debt. I'm going to say that again, $28 trillion, that's with a T, and it's rapidly growing every day. Um, We've had a lot of our leaders raise the flag on this as a threat to our national security. We've had former military leaders like Admiral McMullen and former Secretary of Defense Mattis say that this mounting debt is one of the top security threats to our nation because it really threatens our ability to fund a strong national defense. Now, as an organization of veterans and military families, uh, we really take this potential threat to America's interest very seriously. And as a part of our work, we continue to support efforts to return U.S. spending to more sustainable levels. Now, joining us today to discuss the out of control debt and uh, how it impacts our national security is Congressman Whitman. Uh, Congressman Whitman represents Virginia's first district. Uh, his district goes from the most outer portion of the DC suburbs out to Hampton Roads, and he has a very large active duty military and veteran population. So it's uh, no surprise at all that he serves as the vice ranking chair on the Armed Forces Committee. He's a ranking member of the Sea Power and Projection Forces Committee. Um, and Congressman Whitman has identified uh, the national security risk that our debt poses, and he has sponsored legislation to combat these deficits and really improve our budgeting processes. So also joining us today, we have Tyler Koteski. Um, Tyler is a senior foreign policy analyst here at CVA. Uh, he joined CVA back in 2018, and he really helps craft our policy agenda in support of a prudent and more effective uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, so I thank you both for joining me here today, and I really look forward to this conversation. Um, I do want to get started with you, Congressman Whitman. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between our debt and national security? Absolutely. Well, the debt has a direct effect upon our national security. Roseanne, as you pointed out, it, uh, it competes with the dollars needed to rebuild our military. Remember, we're building a military not just to defend the nation today, but also to have the capability to defend against the future threats from China, from Russia, North Korea, Iran, and other threats from around the world. It's incredibly important that we put this in perspective as to where we are today. As you spoke about, if you add in the recent COVID-19 relief package, which only 9% went towards defeating the COVID-19 virus, the remaining portion of that were for other elements unrelated to, to COVID-19 uh, efforts, you see that that adds another $2 trillion to the debt, which puts us at $30 trillion of debt which is just mind boggling. I have a hard time getting my head around that amount of money. But to put it in perspective, if you were to represent a million dollars with a stack of thousand dollar bills, your stack would be about six inches high. If you represent $30 trillion of debt with a stack of thousand dollar bills, your stack would be 78 miles high. That's, that's what we're talking about. So it's mind boggling. And yes, it does have an effect on the entire federal budget. And we've been blessed to have very low interest rates over the past really 10 years. But my concern is, is with this massive amount of additional federal spending, remember between the now five COVID-19 relief bills, that has spent an additional $5.5 trillion now, to put that in perspective, we spent $4.8 trillion on World War II. So you can see where we are with this total effort. So you add that in, and what I believe potentially happens with that are inflationary pressures. And if you put that on top of what we already see is efforts on reducing 
energy independence with taking away the XL pipeline, which now we see the price of gasoline going up. Uh, when you start to add all those things together, it's problematic. We are at record low interest rates today. And even at record low interest rates, we still pay uh, well north, almost at $400 billion a year, just in interest, not paying a penny of principal, just in interest out of about a $4.6 trillion budget. If interest rates were to go up and they're so low right now, it's not inconceivable that they could easily double. Now we see where we are. We'd be approaching a trillion dollars in what we pay on interest on the national debt. So yes, it does have an effect. It will take money out of the budget that we need for national defense. And any economist will tell you, any economist, any economist worth their salt, that once the national debt approaches 100% of GDP, which is where it is now, it does start to have an impact on the United States. And why? Because there's a finite amount of money out there. The Fed moves money in and out. It also sells U.S. debt through bonds, and people have to buy that debt. Uh, and if they don't buy it, then the Fed comes in and purchases it. Well, you know, the question becomes then who holds the United States debt? We know China holds a significant amount of it and others do, but there's also some that's held internally. And the question always becomes, you know, what's the Fed doing? And that's why I'm an adamant uh, proponent of auditing the Federal Reserve, because I think there are a lot of things that are kind of the undercurrent that we really don't know what's going on that potentially can have a big impact on this nation's economy. So if you add all of those things up, uh, it really puts the area of federal budgeting in a very precarious position because you can only deficit spend if people will continue to lend you money and they have to believe that they will be paid back. And for those that say, oh, the national debt isn't the problem, it's really not that critical that we pay it back, that's a bunch of malarkey because it is important that we pay it back. It is important how people rate the credit worthiness of the United States. Uh, so it does have an impact not only in our economy and how we can economically compete against other superpowers, but also what can we devote to making sure that we strategically compete with them. And China is the pacing threat right now. In fact, I've just been through multiple briefings today about the continuing um, heightening of the threat from China. And I'm, let me tell you, that's one of the things that keeps me up at night. And we have to make the investment in not only readiness today, but readiness in the future. And that's going to take a significant investment from this nation. And for anybody that thinks that, you know, we should just capitulate to China, doesn't understand what China's about. China, China, the Chinese Communist Party is ruthless and relentless. And their single purpose is to economically and strategically defeat the United States. Make no mistake about it. They're not in the business of saying, hey, we want to be a friend of the United States. They want to dominate the United States. That will not be in our best interest. Well, I think it's uh, really interesting, the, uh, the, the points you raise about you know, just how much, even from what our official debt is right now, how much it's increased since those relief packages have passed. You know, Obviously, we're in a situation where um, we we want to make sure that there's an appropriate response to COVID-19. Unfortunately, so many of the proposals just haven't been, um, you know, targeted and tailored enough. And mm -hmm. this is the result we see. And you know, I I, I think it's it was uh, great that you mentioned um, the debt the debt to GDP ratio. Just considering, you know, we're looking now at the CBO kind of comparing where we are now, and it's it, we're on track to peak uh, or to pass our our World War II and post World War II peak, which is mind boggling, you know, considering yeah. we are in a, a total war against a, a existential threat, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, fortunately, we're now at peacetime, albeit, you know, facing challenges, but not at the same uh, level by any stretch. Um, you know, I, I wanted to uh, also, you know, kind of bring up the fact too the the CBO has uh, for years kind of talked about the crowding out effect. Uh, of debt and how this reduces private investment that could otherwise grow the economy. And particularly when we're talking about, um, you know, making sure that we can protect our, our vital national interests, right? Uh, limiting our long-term growth potential, uh, you know, uh, reduces our ability to, to peacefully deter uh, some of these threats, hopefully um, longer term. 
And so I guess kind of with all that in mind, what do you think uh, the best things that Congress can try to do in terms of uh, policy reforms to sort of more sustainably right size uh, what our spending is looking like? Well, Tyler, the first thing we have to do is we have to reform the budgeting and appropriations process because it is irrevocably broken. And what happens each year is that the budget requests from the White House come over to Congress late. We're supposed to get a budget adopted, and that is to set the top line in spending in total, and then all 12 of the different appropriations areas. That's supposed to be done by April 15th. When it's not, it takes longer now for the appropriations subcommittees to make their decisions on how much money they'll appropriate under the figures given to them by, uh, by the Budget Act. So they'll say, you know, in national defense, you can spend up to, but not over, let's say $750 billion. So those are the targets that the appropriators need. So you've got to pass a budget. And when you don't pass a budget, then the appropriators don't have anything to work to. So it makes it much more difficult to get through the, through the legislative process. So I've got a bill in called the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Responsibility in, in Budgeting Act. Essentially, it's, I call it No Budget, No Pay. And what it says is this. It says if Congress doesn't get a budget done on time, that is by April 15th, not a single member of Congress gets a paycheck because I think it ought to be pay for performance. That's the only way you're going to reform Congress. You have to make sure that there's skin in the game by members. And how do you get skin in the game? You go to people's income and everybody else has to abide by that. If you run a business, if you don't produce a product, people aren't going to pay you. If you're, if you're not doing things uh, to create value for the company you work for, you're eventually going to be shown the door. Uh, and that's the way Congress needs to operate. Another element, too, once we get through the budgeting process, assuming we get reform to where budgets are done on time, then the second part is getting appropriations bills done on time. And that is getting them done before the end of the federal fiscal year, which is September 30th. And remember, uh, it's been uh, like three decades ago now where they changed the federal fiscal year from the 1st of July to the end of September, thinking, well, we'll give a little more time there and that'll give time for Congress to do its job. Well, that never happened. You know, Congress, uh, Congress expands the job to fill the time available. And so what happens is both the House uh, and, and many times the Senate go home for all of August. And listen, that's an artifact of the past. It goes back to the days when horse and buggy were the main means of transportation, when there was no air conditioning. Uh, and, and those were the things that, that really required for people to leave Washington. Uh, today, we got plenty of air conditioning, plenty of jet aircraft. There's no reason to leave Washington. Yet this past year, we left Washington for six weeks, knowing that when we came back, we had 13 legislating days to try to get all these appropriations bills passed and it never gets done. We end up with these continuing resolutions, which are an abdication of our responsibility to budget, and they waste a massive amount of money. In fact, a number of years ago, Secretary of the Navy Richard Spencer, when he was asked, what impact does the or do these uh, these continuing resolutions have? And he said, just on the Navy, United States Navy, from 2009 to 2017, it resulted in the waste of four billion dollars. And he said, that's taking $4 billion and putting it in the trash can and burning it. It's not moving it around and you can use it at another time. So very, very wasteful process. So I have another building called the Stay on Schedule Act. And it simply says this, you get to go home for August, which many members use as vacation. You get to go home in August if you get all 12 appropriations bills done. If you don't, you stay in Washington. And guess what? Two years ago, Mitch McConnell kept the Senate in session in Washington through August for one purpose, and that is to get appropriations bills done. And guess what happened? All of the appropriations bills got done. So we know that it can happen. We know the right motivators are to keep members in Washington until it gets done. And then last but not least is we end up then many times at the end of September with not even a continuing resolution with the government shutdown. And the ironic thing about that is when the government shuts down, guess what? Federal employees don't get paid. And we even saw years ago, the Coast Guard didn't get paid. Now we have a provision in there that military members get paid, but the Coast Guard members did not. So federal employees don't get paid. So FBI agents, 
uh, treasury officials, uh, the treasury officers, uh, U.S. Marshal Service, all those folks don't get paid. Yet, guess what? They're considered essential and they have to go into work. But then we have other employees that are considered non-essential. So when taxpayers ask me, they say, well, Rob, why do we have non-essential employees? And I said, that's a great question. So you have this dichotomy. So some people have to come into work. Some people uh, don't. Nobody gets paid. And then, of course, we pay them afterwards, which we should. But then some people get to stay home during that period of time. It, it just doesn't make sense. And the ironic thing through all of that is, guess who continues to get paid? The group of people that haven't done their work, the 535 members of Congress, continue to get a paycheck. So I've got a bill in that clearly says this, pretty simple, that if there's a shutdown, we pay federal employees, but we don't pay members of Congress, which is the way it should be. You talk about a motivating factor. So I think if you do those things now, I wish I could tell you, Tyler, that I had lots of members of Congress to sign on to those bills. And I believe if they were here uh, looking at serving their constituents, that they wouldn't hesitate to sign on to those. I've had some people said, I can't be responsible for other members. I said, well, if you want to get your own legislation passed, what do you do? You engage at least 217 other members because you need 218 votes to get things passed. There's nothing different with this. This is just passing a bill that doesn't necessarily have your individual name on it, but it's a bill that I would argue is as important, if not more important than any other bill that passes the Congress. So I think if you do those fundamental reforms, you can actually get this place to work the way it's supposed to. Anything short of that, I think, is still going to lead to delays and lots of political back and forth and not getting the nation's work done. I think that's a it's a great point. You know, the, the incentives that the legislators have um, that maybe they don't uh, experience, you know, impacting other people. Uh, it's, it's so crucial to, to be able to, uh, you know, hold decision makers accountable like that. And that's certainly something that we try to do here at CVA, you know, with our, our grassroots operations and whatnot. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm curious too, uh, you mentioned shutdowns and just how, how destructive those can be, you know, something we like to always remember as everyone thinks when the government's shutting down that we're saving money, but given the, the backlogs and all the upheaval that happens, they're invariably cost taxpayers far more money all told at the end of the day. Um, you know, what do you think, uh, you know, in addition to sort of uh, putting, putting the proverbial uh, feet under the fire of the members uh, in terms of their, their pay and whatnot, what do you think about uh, reforms like a, a auto continuing resolution to sort of take the leverage away from we have to uh, pass this budget immediately, no matter how uh, out of sync, how untargeted it might be, inflated it could be, um, you know, compared to the more sort of uh, gradual pressure over time that that the incentives you talk about could produce to help ensure that our policy you know, particularly, you know, whether it's domestic or on national security is more, more uh, uh, prudently crafted. Sure. Well, listen, there's been a lot of talk about auto CRs. The problem with auto CRs is that they still just extend status quo. And for the military, that becomes problematic. What we actually have to do is to put in exceptions for the military, because, you know, if you are funding the building of a ship, you can't stop that funding and send shipbuilders home because we know how incredibly problematic that is, not only in wasting money, but but delays in getting that ship out to the fleet and protecting the nation. So uh, if, if you were to do that, you'd have to write in certain provisions to exempt new starts in the military, because that's the big impact on the military is, is new starts or, or doing things that you have to do to position the military to be successful. Remember, under a CR, everything's status quo. So your only permission you get is to keep doing the things that, that, that you've been doing. One thing, Tyler, that I think would be incredibly helpful is for the nation to move to a biennial budget. You see many states do that. And what you could do is to split the appropriations bills in half. So do six one year, do six the other year. And then the only thing you'd be faced with is doing an off-year adjustment to the six appropriations bills that were adopted the year before. Pretty simple process, very truncated. So all you have to do is to make a few changes many times because there's a little change in direction that might be needed, let's say for the military. Pretty easy process. And then you make the process 
much, much more attainable. Now, some folks had said, well, we changed the federal year, you know, from uh, from the first of July to the end of September. That didn't help. Well, you still have that that massive amount of work to do with 12 appropriations bills, and some of them are more difficult to pass than others. And unfortunately, they will always hold the defense appropriations bill to the end because it's the only lever they have to try to get all the other ones done. And then we end up most of the time with these either a mini bus where they combine a bunch of other appropriations bills along with ones that must pass like the defense appropriations bill. So it doesn't let you really get at managing the budget in a proper way. So I think a biennial budget would at least increase the chances of getting things done on time. Uh, and the, the key is though with, with an auto CR, the question would be is, you know, how long would it continue? And if you just automatically increase it and there's no accountability on members of Congress's behalf, then it becomes easy to just let the auto CR kick in and say, well, you know, we tried or we have, have to keep doing things. Now, at some point, normally when you get past the first of January of the following year, there starts to be big problems that are compounded by, you know, putting these, uh, these funding decisions off. So at some point it would, I think, push the issue but uh, it, it, it could, if it had the proper checks and balances in there, it, it could be an effective mechanism. What you'd have to do is to put some, uh, put some requirements in there to say you can only use uh, a auto CR for a limited amount of time. Uh, there has to be certain provisions in, that have to be met in order for, the, for it to be put in place. And that is you at least have to have appropriations bills all the way through committees they at least have to be on the schedule to come to the House floor. You know, some performance requirements there. So at least you have certainty to say you're on the path and you can't use this just by default to, to kick the can down the road. This is very good um, information you guys are putting out. Um, I do want to say for those of you just tuning in, my name is Roseanne Rodriguez. I am the Coalition's Director for CVA here in Virginia, and we are talking with Virginia Congressman Rob Whitman and Senior Foreign Policy Analyst from CVA, Tyler Kateski. We are talking about securing America's financial future. If 28 at 30, let me correct that. If $30 trillion of debt bothers you, um, we ask you to sign our petition. The link's in the chat. So check out the petition and sign it. Tyler? So yeah, I guess kind of pivoting from the, the budget process specifically, because that, that, you know, this, this focus on uh, I think how we spend our money is really does feed into how much we end up spending, right? And if we're if we have the wrong processes, we end up with bloated budgets. And, you know, I think you have the, the fortunate position of being in a, a unique oversight position, uh, you know, with your, your vice ranking membership of House Armed Services. Um, and, you know, you're, you've been a, a long term advocate of modernizing our forces so that uh, our, our military is well equipped to uh, deter these threats that you mentioned, um, you know, and at the same time, as we seek to meet those goals, we've seen, um, you know, in the past decade, certainly some some acquisitions issues, right, yeah. with with plenty of programs. So, you know, just to to throw out a few, I think of uh, the literal combat chip or the the Zoom Alt class destroyer, um, which is not to say that they weren't necessarily fulfilling, uh, you know, strategic gaps that would have been useful, but that we saw, you know, massive uh, cost overruns and serious reliability issues. And you know, certainly also as we're trying to think about uh, the future of our aircraft carrier fleet, um, the continuing overruns and reliability issues with the Ford class carriers. So I'm wondering, uh, how do you think that uh, the Armed Services Committee can uh, help sort of learn from or can help us learn from these mistakes in the past to improve our acquisitions in the future? You know, particularly as we're uh, doing really long-term projects like shipbuilding and whatnot. Sure. Well, Tyler, I think one of the things that we can do is to look at when we make major purchases to do that in volume because there's significant savings. I push to make sure for the next two Ford-class uh, aircraft carriers, we purchase them two at a time. When we do that, we are able to save $4 billion. We used to buy ships in block buys before. Buying them now in block buy saves significant amounts of money. I also worked with Mac Thornberry, who was the previous ranking member and chairman of the Armed Services Committee on acquisition reform and doing simple things like allowing 
the different elements of the military branches to purchase things over the shelf. We call it the Amazon rule. So you don't have to go to a federal purchasing list and buy something there from a federally approved vendor. You can go to Amazon and buy things that you know you shouldn't have to go through these, these various steps. And most of the time you can find them at a much less expensive rate uh, out there uh, in, the, in the virtual realm because there's a lot of competition out there. It takes a lot to get on a federal vendors list. It doesn't take a whole lot to be on Amazon. So uh, what we wanna do is to simplify that process, make sure too we simplify the administrative processes. And we wanna make sure too that we empower small businesses. You know, We spend a lot of money in phase one and phase two SBIRs, which are small business innovation grants that go to businesses. So they do a lot of research and development in those realms, which is great. The problem is, is we do very little in phase threes, which is where these businesses actually graduate to producing the things that they have developed. Uh, so when you do that, you don't have the small businesses that are hungry and compete against the big prime contra contractors. So we have to do more of that. We've been pushing the service branches to say, we wanna understand exactly what are you doing to award more contracts to these smaller businesses so they can get off the ground. And so there's more competition. Competition is a good thing. It's amazing the innovation and creation that comes from these small businesses. And we want to make sure too that they're not penalized for getting bigger. You know, there are thresholds there to where if you start as a small business and grow to a medium business, once you get over a certain size, that is number of employees and total revenue, you get cut off from being able to compete for these contractual opportunities that are actually set aside for these for these small businesses. So we want to make sure that businesses can grow. Uh, and so taking away those impediments, I think, are, are incredibly important. Another thing, too, that's just happened, it's long overdue, and that is we finally have a comprehensive audit of the Pentagon. Now, it's, it's not a clean audit, so there are a lot of things there that you look at and go, wow, what's going on there? But at least that's a starting point to say, where can we make the processes better? Where can we be more efficient in spending money? And where can we make sure that there's accountability within the Pentagon for the dollars that are spent? There's still a lot of duplication. There's still a lot of efforts that unfortunately are, are more about turf building than they are about getting things done. The Pentagon's a tremendously large organization. So what we want to try to do is to get decision making down to the lowest level possible, uh, create not only accountability, but authority. You know, what we've done, too, is to give greater purchasing authority to folks in the service branches so they don't have to go through OSD, the Office of Secretary of Defense, to get approval on everything. Because what happens is that delays things. Everybody's got to put their check on a piece of paper. And then a lot of times people are risk averse. So if you need to get new technology out to the warfighter and do it with off the shelf means many times you just can't do it because it's administratively not only tough, but sometimes impossible to do that. So Chairman Thornberry and I have worked over the past four years to, to cut out a lot of this bureaucracy, to simplify the process. But listen, it's like turning around an aircraft carrier. The systems in the Pentagon are really entrenched. It's tough in a large organization like that to really move things. Some of the acquisition folks are doing a better job. Some areas, not as good as they need to be doing. So we have to continue the effort to look at ways to save money. I think too, in the budgeting process, you have to put some incentives in there for the service branches to save money and said, listen, if you save money, we're gonna allow you to use a number of those dollars to put back in things like modernization and building the capacity and capability in the force that you need, instead of saying, well, if you, if you save money, it just goes away because then there's no incentive to save money. You don't have the ability to use the money for the purposes that you see are best suited uh, and we've seen the, the uh, service branches are willing to step up to the plate. We saw the Navy go in and save a significant amount of money by pointing out what they could do to either eliminate programs, to eliminate duplication, or to do things more efficiently. We have to build in mechanisms like that also. Absolutely. I mean, I think what you're saying about you know, uh, uh, empowering people with more of the local knowledge on the ground to, to find cost-saving measures is crucial in any organization, and especially one as high stakes as as our military, um, you know, and I, I think what you said about the the cost saving incentives in programs as well, and, and 
the rewards for not necessarily going over the top with certain components if they're not necessary. Um, you know, I, I think of, for instance, like the catapult system in the Ford class carrier, uh, which the project and government oversight was, was uh, talking about how, you know, it's it moved on from a, the more reliable steam system that we've got in a lot of our, our past ones uh, to one that's much harder to maintain. And if it breaks down, it's, it gets in the way of a lot of the, the air operations and whatnot. And it seems to me from reading that, that, uh, you know, poses a huge strategic disadvantage for our carrier groups, you know, and that there's, uh, I, I guess, you know, perhaps there's some issue there too with um, thinking through the wrong incentives in the other direction, such as you get extra money because it uh, involves some innovation of some kind, whether or not it's the right one for that specific job. Right. Yeah, I think, I think there's some things we need to look at, you know, with the Ford class carrier, some amazing technology there, but in putting that much new technology on a first in class ship, I think the Navy would, would tell you that if they had to do it over again, they would not have put that much new uh, technology in there. You have multi-arrayed radars. I remember going, I was the first member of Congress to fly out to the Ford. And when I got out to the Ford, they had an off the shelf Raytheon radar unit on board. So the multi-array the multi radar unit was not on board. Uh, they were having some challenges with the advanced arresting gear and the EMALS, the electron, electromagnetic launch system there. And what they had to do was to essentially reboot the system. So we were watching air operations and all of a sudden things stopped. Luckily, they didn't have a lot of aircraft in the air, but, but they had to stop and do a reboot, which was 30 minutes. So as you can imagine, you know, if you're, if you're part of that testing operation and you're up in the air and you're not back on the deck, of course, they have a, an airplane up there that's that's got fuel on board that they can tank. But, you know, and when they do that, they're close enough to Norfolk to where these the jet could fly to Norfolk and land. So they have that contingency built in. But think about it. If you're on deployment and you have a failure like that, that's not a good scenario. The last thing you want is an F-18, you know, having to uh, having to uh, uh, having to, to to put down in the water and have a pilot and, and co-pilot eject. So, you know, those are elements that I think uh, have to be worked out. Now, to give the Navy credit, they've worked through those issues. I think they're up to about 5,000 traps and cat shots now, and they've got the system up to be pretty reliable. The one area, though, that uh, still has some challenges are the weapons elevators. They have the upper elevators taken care of, which are also electromagnetically actuated and run. So you have the elevators from the hangar deck that are working, but the elevators that go down to the weapon stores, you know, are still, uh, they're just about at operational status, but it's taken years to be able to do that. And what they found is that when they build the ship, the tracks that have the electromagnets in it have to be exactly aligned. If they're off, even by the smallest margin, the system doesn't work. So they have been on a steep learning curve there. The good news is they put what they've learned in the Ford into the JFK as they're building CVN 78. And I think we'll be in a much, much better position with the new carrier, but, you know, lessons learned and lessons learned, uh, you know, with a more expensive first, first in the class ship. Um, so thanks again. Uh, my name, or once again, my name is Roseanne Rodriguez. I am the coalition's director for CVA here in Virginia. And we are talking with Virginia Congressman Rob Whitman and senior foreign policy policy analyst from CVA, Tyler Koteski. If you would like to help us send a message to Congress to rein in the $30 trillion of debt, um, be sure to go and sign our petition. You'll find the link to the petition in our comments. Uh, thank you. So, you know, it's, it's been really interesting to hear kind of your thoughts about how to ensure that you know, we're, we're spending our limited defense resources as, as wisely as possible through, you know, the way we decide to spend them to make sure that, you know, both our war fighters and our taxpayers aren't getting a, a raw deal from uh, some of the, the systems that we're building for them. Um, and I know that when you, uh, you know, acceded as the new uh, uh, vice ranking member for armed services, you, you mentioned in your, your statement, you know, you both committed to uh, modernization, but also to kind of rolling back some of the more obsolete systems out there, or at least less effective uh, ones in these days. And uh, I guess as we think about that need to make sure, you know, knowing that 
we don't have an unlimited amount to spend, that the amount that we do spend on our armed forces is going to its you know, most effective use mm -hmm. to best protect our security. Uh, you know, what are, what are some examples of, of uh, weapon systems we might look to wind down and, and why is it important to sort of prioritize how we spend those resources? Sure. Well, listen, there are a lot of legacy systems out there that in their day were extraordinarily effective and in certain combat situations were great. A great example is the A-10. Uh, the A-10 is a tank with wings. I mean, extraordinarily important. Uh, close air support, if you ask any, anybody in the infantry, uh, they would love the sound of that A-10 Warthog coming in uh, when, they, when they needed, uh, needed air cover. Uh, the key is though, is that it did have certain limitations. And when we were in the conflict in Afghanistan, and Iraq, they had a role. But as far as where we're gonna be in the future, in the Indo-Pacific, not so much. So, you know, it's one example where there was some hesitancy to retire the aircraft. Uh, now the Air Force is into retiring it as they bring up on, on new F-35s. Uh, and listen, there's been some issues with F-35s too, with the uh, production of the engine on F-35. We see right now there's been some shortage in parts, so it's delayed manufacturing. We had a whole debate about whether or not to have a dual engine program, so you had a backup engine in case there was issues with the engine that they're producing right now, which we see we, we, we find ourselves. So I, I think that's a, an example of a legacy system that uh, you know, has been taken out of inventory. Another one that uh, is, is on the block to be taken out is the, uh, is the AAV. Uh, the amphibious assault vehicle, which has been around 50 plus years now in the Marine Corps. And, and we went through the, um, uh, the expeditionary fighting vehicle, the EFV, uh, and we saw that there were some issues there, um, massive costs uh, that resulted in the, in the platform being too expensive per unit. So now they've gone to the ACV, the uh, amphibious combat vehicle, where they are getting to the point of, of getting those, those vehicles out there to replace the AAVs. But again, that's an example about where there was a hesitancy to terminate a program, even though it had gone awry. There were a whole list of non McCurdy breaches. I went out to look at the program out at Camp Pendleton. And uh, again, a lot of effort to try to resurrect the program. Listen, Congress was at fault on some of that. You had members on the Sea Power Subcommittee that wanted the, the vehicle to do all kinds of different things uh, in, in missions it was never designed for, but they wanted to have it once it get out of the water to be like an MRAP, so to put an applique on. I mean, all things that just led to time and, and money. So listen, Congress is at fault somewhat with this, but at the time, Commandant uh, uh, General Amos said, listen, we're going to terminate the EFV because we've spent too much money on it and it's not gonna be affordable per copy. And he went out and talked to a lot of Marines, active duty and retired, went through a, a whole evaluation process to find out what was the best combination of capability and affordability, and then decided on the ACV, which I think was, was the right decision. So you have to also let value uh, enter into the decision-making process. So that's another effort where they finally terminated a program that should have been terminated earlier. We had a hearing today with the Navy on unmanned systems, uh, large unmanned surface vessels, uh, large underwater uh, unmanned vessels. Uh, those systems are gonna be critically important in the future, but what we wanna make sure is that the Navy and Marine Corps has fully thought out how you're gonna integrate those systems. Because we see situations like littoral combat ship but there's still shortcomings in what it can do based on what was promised it could do, the same with DDG-1000 and, and others. We don't want to repeat that. We think if we spend a little more time making sure we fully evaluated how unmanned systems are going to work, are they going to be lightly manned? Under what conditions will they be unmanned? How do we do all those things? And let's answer that up front instead of building a bunch of them and then saying, oh, gosh, we didn't get it right. And then we both wasted time and money. So we want to make sure the Navy is getting that right. That's another element of, as I've said, I said, uh, you know, be aggressive. If you're going to fail, fail big and fail quickly. You know, go, go, go for it. If you say, sorry, that didn't work, you know, don't hang on. Don't say, gosh, we got to make this work. Say, hey, listen, we learned a lot from that. This isn't going to work. 
let's let's move on to move on to something else and don't waste a lot of time with it. The problem is in the Pentagon is, you know, in the past, it's been a career killer. So the last thing you want to do is to be in charge of a program that gets terminated because folks look at it. Oh, you guys, you're the one that was in charge of the expeditionary fighting vehicle program. Yeah, I know what you went through. So, you know, we have to make sure that people aren't risk averse or willing to push the issue and know that it's not a career killer. If you get in and push the envelope and, and the and the the direction um failed. In fact, I would argue should be rewarded to early on say, sorry, it didn't work. We're, we're, we're going to save our money and go in a different direction. I, I, absolutely. You know, and it's, it's, it's fascinating how in, in the private sector often, you know, helping your firm avoid a massive failure like that, even if on paper, it's a small failure is rightly rewarded. And that, that incentive can be, can be lacking, of course. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, nearing kind of towards the end of our, our mm-hmm. event here, but, uh, Congressman, you know, I think you've made some really excellent points here just about the the intersection between, you know, both how our debt's unsustainable, um, you know, what we can be doing uh, with Congress to make sure that we're improving the process of how we spend our money to to reduce that that uh, that hugely increasing thirty trillion dollars, you know, but also how to make sure that as we're uh, you know, growing our economy long term to be able to better protect our national security that we're wisely spending those security resources as well. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Roseanne to kind of help close us out here. Okay. All right. This this has been a great discussion, and I know you guys have put out a lot of information. Um, and I've traveled around the state of Virginia, and as you know, I've heard a lot from Virginians who are truly concerned about the sustainability of our debt and what that means to our national security. Um, so, Congressman, can you share with our viewers what key information you want them to take away from this conversation? Well, the key information I want all of your members and your attendees today to take away is that the path we're on for debt is unsustainable. And it does have an impact on this nation. It does have an impact economically and strategically. And what we all have to do is to demand accountability from our lawmakers and how they pursue the budgeting and appropriations process. And listen, we pointed out earlier, we did have to put some money out there in order to um, guard against the dreadful impacts of COVID-19. I would argue, though, there were many other areas where we could have been much wiser, and there are many dollars that were spent that were not directly related to COVID-19, uh, and, and we're going to end up, not us, but our children, our children's children are going to end up paying for that. So we have to be adamant about demanding accountability, demanding transparency, demanding a responsible budgeting and appropriations process that gets done on time, that focuses not on properly funding the functions of government, the constitutionally mandated functions of government, but also focuses on being fiscally responsible. And that is, you know, I'd love to see a balanced budget amendment, although it seems like today there's not a whole lot of interest in that. I am interested in it, in reforming the process. So uh, what I would tell your members and attendees is to communicate with your members of Congress demand from them what are they going to do to institute fiscal responsibility that addresses the deficit and the debt because they're both interrelated if you deficit spend you're going to add to the debt the only way that you address the debt is to do away with deficits and then start to take those dollars and pay down the principal in the debt and think about this think about where we are today and i would have your members point this out to members of congress if you are average citizen and you have borrowed money from the bank and let's say you owe the bank $100,000 and, uh, and all you have been able to do is to pay the interest on the loan. At some point, the bank is going to say, sorry, that's not how we operate. We're going to put the loan into default and you're going to have to pay it all off or declare bankruptcy. But think about it. If you went to the bank and said, hey, listen, I, I can't pay the principal, but also can't pay the interest. Would you lend me money so I can pay the interest on your loan? They would laugh you right out of the bank and say, sorry, we want you to pay off the loan. But that's where the United States government is. We borrow money each year just to pay the interest on the national debt, not to pay down the principal, to pay the interest on the national debt. And it's not out of the realm that uh, that interest rates could double. And if you talk about a significant impact on the federal budget, that would be it. So I would urge your members to talk about being fiscally responsible, that nobody else is allowed to to fiscally manage their business uh, or their operations like this. 
and that demand accountability and point out the risks of what happens if inflation kicks in and interest rates go up, we're going to find ourselves in a really bad spot. Well, Congressman, I'm going to thank you so much for your time today and all the work that you are doing to, to raise awareness and to try to correct some of these um, deficiencies we're having with our debt um, to secure our national security and also for helping us understand how we can keep America more secure by ensuring we spend our limited resources smartly and sustainably. Um, also want to thank all of the, you who have joined us on our Facebook page. Um, if you are interested in joining CVA's effort to combat our out of control debt so that we're better able to protect America, I encourage you to sign our petition in the chat. Um, it's help secure America's financial future. I'm also going to ask you um, for to share that link as well with others in your community so that they can sign it as well. Um, that's all I have. Um, until next time, thank you. Roseanne, Tyler, thank you. Thanks very much, Congressman. Thanks so much. Thank you.